In this video, we are going to take a look at what we need to do and what we need to consider when we are chunking text for large language models. The best way I can think of, of demonstrating this is to walk through an example. Now, we're gonna really go with the what I believe is kind of like a rule of thumb that I tend to use when I'm when I'm chunking text in order to put into a large language model. And it doesn't necessarily apply to every use case. You know, every use case is slightly different. But I think this is a pretty good approach, at least when we're using retrieval augmentation and large language models, which I think is where the chunking question kind of comes up most often. So let's jump straight into it. In this example, what we're going to be doing is taking the Langchain docs here, uh, literally every page on this website, and we're going to be downloading those, taking each one of these pages, and then we're going to be splitting them into more reasonably sized chunks. Now, how are we going to do this? We're going to take a look at this notebook here. Now, if you'd like to follow along with the code, you can also run this notebook. I will leave a link to it, which will appear somewhere near the top of the video right now. Now to get started, we're going to be using a few Python libraries. Langchain is a pretty big one here. So not only is it the documentation that we're downloading, but it's also going to be how we download that documentation. And it's also going to be how we split that documentation into chunks. Uh, and another dependency here is the tick token tokenizer we'll talk about that later and we're just going to visualize and make things a little bit easier to follow with these uh, libraries here so in this example first thing we're going to do is download all of the dots from Langchain. so everything is contained within like, this is the top level page of the Langchain docs we're going to save everything into this directory here and we, we are going to say we want to get all of the .html files, okay? So we run that and that will take a moment just to download everything. There's a lot in there. My internet connection is also pretty slow, so it will probably take me a moment. But let's go ahead and just have a look at where these are being downloaded. So if we come over to the left here, we can see there is the RT Docs repository there. And inside the RT docs, we have this blank chain read docs, en latest, which is just kind of like the path of our docs. And okay, cool. So in there, you can see everything's being downloaded. We have like the index page, which I think is the, the top level page. And we can see it's just, it's HTML. Okay, so it's kind of like when we're not gonna process this, we're gonna use line chain to clean this up. But uh, if we come down a little bit, I think maybe we can see something. Okay, so this is like the the first page. Welcome to Langchain. LLMs are emerging as a transformative technology, so on and so on. Okay, and we have some other things, other pages. Yeah, we're just going to process all of this. So back to our code. Uh, it's done downloading now. We can come down to here. And what we're going to do is use the Langchain document loaders and we're going to use a read the docs loader. So read the docs is a specific template that is used quite often for documentation for, for code libraries. And Langchain includes a document loader that is specifically built for reading that type of documentation or, or that those HTML pages and processing them into a nicer format. So it's really easy to use it. We just point it to our directory that we just created and what are we doing here? So we're loading those docs. And here I'm just printing out the length of those docs so that we can see, okay, we have 390 uh, HTML pages that have been downloaded there. For some reason, okay, so when I, when I ran this about an hour ago, uh, they, they actually had 389. Now they have 390 pages, so it's already out of date. Cool. All right, let's have a look at one of those pages. So we have this, we have this document object. Inside that we have page content, which is all of our text, all right? If we want to print that in a nicer format, uh, we can see this, okay? All right, looks, looks pretty good. There's a lot of, you know, there is some kind of messy parts of this, but it's, it's not really a problem. The, the, we could try and process that if we wanted to, 
But honestly, I don't really think it's worth it because the large orange model can handle this very easily. So yeah, I, I personally wouldn't really bother with that. I'd just take it as it is. Now, at the end of this object, we come right to the end, uh, if it lets me, we'll see that we have this metadata here. Okay, inside the metadata, we have the source, uh, which is in this case, like the file path. But fortunately, the way that we've like set this up is that we can just replace RT docs with HTTPS and that will give us the URL for this particular file. So let's come down here and you can see that's what I'm doing here. Replace RT docs with HTTPS. Cool. Uh, and then we can click that and we come over to here. Now, this is where we start talking about the chunking of, of what we're doing. When we are thinking about chunking, there are, there are a few things to consider. Okay, so the first thing to consider is how much text or how many tokens can our large language model or whatever process it is we're, we're doing, how many tokens can it handle? What is optimal for our particular use case? The use case that I'm envisioning here is retrieval augmentation for like question answering using a larger language model. So what, what does that mean exactly? It's probably best if I draw it out. So we're gonna have our large language model over here and we're gonna ask it a question. So we have our question over here, it's supposed to be a Q, it's fine. So we have our question like we're gonna say, uh, what is the LM chain in Langchain, right? If we pass that straight into our large language model, at the moment using our GPT 3.5 Turbo, even GPT 4, they can't answer that question because they don't know what the Langchain library is. So in this scenario, what we would do is we'd go to vector database. You know, we don't really need to go into too much detail here. We go to a vector database, which is where we'd store all of the documents I'm, that we're processing now, so all those Langchain docs. They would end up within that space and they would be retrieved. And we would pass in like five or so of these chunks of text that are relevant to our particular query alongside our original query, okay? So what you'd end up with is rather than, okay, let's say this is your prompt, you typically have your, your query. Rather than just a query, you'd have your query, and then you'd also have these five like bits of relevant information below the query, okay? And that would all go into the large language model. And you would essentially say to it, you'd probably have some instructions near the top, and those instructions would say, I want you to answer this question you'd you know, maybe give the, the questionnaire and give it a bit later on using the context that we have provided. And you would basically in front of these contexts, you would write like context. Okay. And the large language model will answer the question based on those contexts. Right. So th that's the scenario we're envisioning here. And in this scenario, if we want to input five of these contexts into each one of our retrieval augmented queries, we need to think, okay, what is the max token limit of our large language model? And how much of that space can be reserved for these contexts? So in this scenario, let's say that we're using GPT 3.5 Turbo. The token limit for GPT 3.5 Turbo is something like 4,096. So this includes both, all right, so you have your large language model. I'm going to put that here. This is, pretend this is your large language model. This 4096 includes the input to the large language model, so all of your input tokens, and also all of your generated output tokens, okay? And so basically, we can't just use that full 4,000 tokens on the input. We need to leave some space for the output. And also within the input, we have other components, right? So it's not just the context, but we also have the query. I mean, that's supposed to say query. 
And as well as that, we might also have some instructions. I don't know why my writing is so bad. And as well as the instructions, we might also have a bit of chat history if this is a, a chat bot. Okay. So basically, our, the amount of context that we can feed in is actually pretty limited. In this scenario, let's just assume that we can we can pass in a context of around half of the 4,000 tokens. So we'll say 2,000 is going to be our limit. Okay, if 2,000 is our limit, we that means we need to divide that by five because those 2,000 tokens need to be shared by our five contexts, which leaves us with about 400 of these tokens per context. Okay, so that's our maximum chunk size. Now, one question that we might have here is, could we reduce the number of tokens further? And for sure we can, okay? So I would say the minimum number of tokens that you need within a context is for you to read this context, does it make sense, right? If you have enough words in there for that context to make sense to you as a as a human being, then that means that it is probably enough to feed as a chunk of text into a large language model, into a embedding model, and so on. So if that chunk of text has enough text in there to have some sort of meaning to itself, then the chunk is probably big enough. So as long as you satisfy that, that should be the criteria for your minimum size of that chunk of text. Naturally, for the maximum size of a chunk of text, we have the 400 tokens that we just calculated now. So with that, all of that in mind, we need to take a look at how we would actually calculate the, the size of these chunks, okay? Because we're not basing this on character length, we're basing this on token length. So in order to do that, we need to look at how to tokenize text using the same tokenizer that our large language model uses and then we can actually count the number of tokens within each chunk. So getting started with that, we are going to be using the tick token tokenizer. Now this is specific to open AI models. Obviously if you're using Cohere, Hugging Face and so on, this is going to be a slightly different approach. So first we want to get our encoding. So there are multiple tick token tokenizers that open AI uses. This is just one of those. Now. Let's initialize that and I will talk about a little bit about where we're getting these encoders from. So you can actually find details for the tokenizer at this link here. So this link is in the GitHub repo, tick token, tick token model.py. Okay, so I'm gonna click through to that. Okay, so this is in the OpenAI tick token repository on GitHub and you can see we have this model to encoding uh, dictionary here. And within this, you can see that we have a mapping from each of the models to the particular tokenizer that it uses. We are going to use the GPT 3.5 Turbo model, which uses a CL100K base. And I would say, I think most of the more recent models, like the models that you would be using at the time of recording this video, they, they all use this encoder. Okay, so the, the embeddings model that is the most up-to-date, uses CL100K base. The you know, chat GPTs, uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo uses CL100K base. GPT-4 also uses it. The only one that is still kind of a relevant model is the Text Avenger 003 model. And that is the only relevant model that doesn't use that encoder. So this one uses the P50K base. All right, so in reality, you, you don't even need to go there to find out the encoding that you need to use, you can actually just see this. So take token encoding for model and you can you can run this, right? So you get the CL100K base. That's how we know, okay? Now, anything else? I think that is pretty much it. So, okay, so actually here, I'm creating this tick token length function. So that is gonna take some text. It's going to use the tokenizer to calculate the length of that text in terms of tick token tokens. That's important because we, we need to use that for our line chain splitter function uh, in a moment. So we create that. 
then what we can do is just first before we kind of jump into the whole chunking component I want to have a look at what the length of documents looks like at the moment so I'm going to calculate the token counts the tick token length uh, function come to here we can see the minimum maximum and average number of tokens so the smallest document contains just 45 tokens this is probably I, I don't know <laughs> this is probably a page that we don't really need it probably doesn't contain anything useful in there the maximum is almost 58,000 tokens which is really big I'm not sure I'm not sure what that is but the average is a, a bit more normal so 1.3 thousand there so we can kind of visualize the distribution of those of those pages and the amount of tokens they have so the vast majority of pages have a very like they're more towards the 1000 token range as we can sort of see here all right cool now let's continue and we'll, we'll start having a look at how we're going to chunk everything so again we're using line chain here we're using a text splitter and we're using the recursive character text splitter now this is i think probably one of the best like uh, chunkers or, or text splitters that line chain offers at the moment it's very general purpose they do also offer some text splitters that are more specific to like markdown for example but i you know i i like this one it you can use it for a ton of things. So let me just explain it very quickly. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to take your length function, so the tick token length, and it's going to say, I need to split your text so that each chunk does not go over this chunk size here. So this 400. And it's going to split based on these separators, okay? So the reason we have multiple separators is that it's first starts by trying to find double new lines so this is a double new line separator it's going to try and split on that first if it can't find a, a good split using the double new line characters it will just try a, a single new line then it will try a space and as a very last resort it will just split on anything okay okay cool and then one final thing that we have here is this chunk overlap so this chunk overlap is saying for every chunk we are going to overlap it with the next chunk by 20 tokens okay let me let me draw that out so it makes more sense okay so imagine we we have a ton of text okay there's loads of text here okay now we are going to get a chunk of uh, it's 400 characters right so let's say that chunk takes us from here all the way to say here okay so we have 400 characters in this chunk then the next chunk if we don't have any chunk overlap would be 400 characters from this so that would be you know, let's say it's to here okay but this comes with a problem because we don't know what this information here and this information here is about so they could be related right so we might be missing out on some important information by just splitting in the middle here so it's, it's important to try and avoid that if possible and the most naive way or naive approach for doing this is to include a chunk overlap so what we would do is let's say we take the, the 20 tokens behind this okay so we're gonna go back 20 tokens which maybe comes to here okay so that means that this space here is now going to be shared by the last or the, the first chunk and the next chunk which will also bring back the next chunk to something like here right so now we have chunk one here Okay, which goes from from here up to here and then we have chunk two which is from here to here and then following on from that we would also add another like chunk overlap for number three so number three would go from here to let's say here and finally for number four we'll go from like here to here okay so the chunk overlap is just to make sure that we're not missing any important connections between our chunks 
Okay, it does mean that we're going to have a little bit more data to, to store there, okay, because we're including like these chunks of 20 in multiple places. But I, th I think that's usually worth it in terms of the better performance that you can get by not missing out that important information, that important connection between chunks. Okay, so we initialize that. And then to actually split the text, we use the text splitter, split text. Okay, we're going to take dots five and we're gonna take the, the page content, okay, which is just the, the plain text. Right, so based on our the parameters that we set here, the chunk size of 400 and the chunk overlap of 20 using the tick token length token, we get two chunks. Let's have a look at the length of those two chunks. Okay, so the first chunk that we get is 346 tokens, and the next one, 247. So both within that you know, max upper end limit of 400, okay? So you see that it's not going to necessarily split on the 400 tokens specifically because we have these specific separators that we would like to use, okay? And it's going to optimize uh, preferably for this separator, okay? So we're not going right up to that limit with every single chunk, uh, which is is fine. That's kind of ideal. We don't want to, we don't we don't necessarily need to put in a ton of text there. Okay, so that's it for a single document. What we're going to do now is we're going to repeat that over the entire data set, and the final format that I, I want to create here is going to look like this. Okay, so we're going to have the ID, we're going to have our text, and we're going to have the source where this text is actually come from. Okay. Now, one thing that you'll notice here is the ID. Okay, so we're going to create an ID, and that ID will be unique to each page. Okay, but we're going to have multiple chunks for each page, so that means we're also going to add in this like chunk identifier onto the end of the ID to make sure that every ID for every chunk is actually unique. So as, let me show you how we're going to create that. Uh, essentially, so we have the URL here, okay? We're going to replace the RT docs that we have here with the actual uh, HTTPS protocol. And I'm just gonna print it out so you can see what it is. And then we're gonna take that URL we're going to add it to this hashlib md5. So this is just a hashing function that is going to take our URL and hash it into kind of like a unique identifier, right? So this is useful because if we are updating this text at some point in the future, or, or this data set, sorry, uh, we can use the same hashing function to create our unique IDs. And that means that when we update this particular page, it will just overwrite the previous uh, versions of that item, right? Because we're using the same ID. But of course we don't, we can't use the same ID for every single chunk. So we also need to add in uh, this here, which is like the, the chunk identifier, right? It's just, it's just a count of the number of chunks. So we can see that being created here. So these are just two examples from the previous page that we, we just showed. So you can see we have the trunk identifier and indeed the trunks are different. So this says language model cascades, ice primer books, Socratic models. Okay, whatever. Let's take a look at what is at the end of the first item and it should be something similar. So there should be the overlap that I mentioned, right? Okay, so yeah, you can see. Language model cascades, ice primer books, Socratic models, right? Same thing, cool. So there is the overlap, right? Now what we need to do is repeat this same logic that we've just created across our entire data set. So to do that, same thing that we just did, we're going to take the URL out, we're going to create our unique ID, we're going to take the chunks using the text splitter, and then we're going to append these all to our documents list here. Okay, that's just gonna be where we store everything. Okay, and now, so the length of the documents uh, an hour ago was, was a little bit less. Now it is 2,012 documents. So, sorry, 2,212 documents. Cool. We can now save them to JSON lines file. Actually, that we, we just do this. So 
uh, JSON lines, it's basically, it's, it's what you can see here, right? So if we take a look at the documents, take a look at the first five, it's this, but it's just in a, a JSON lines file, okay? So you can see it here, yeah, same thing, right? Okay, and then once you've saved it and you create your JSONL file, you just load it from file like this. Okay, so you with open train JSONL, wherever you, you sort it, and you just load it iteratively like that. Okay, and you can take a look. Yeah, okay, great. So that's how you would load it. Now, a couple of things here. The reason that we're using JSONL and the reason that I'm calling this train.jsonl is because this makes it very compatible with hugging face data sets, which is essentially a way of sharing your data set with others or just making it more accessible for yourself if you set it to being a, a private data set. So what I want to do is just show you how we can actually go about doing that as well. So the first thing that we need to do is go to huggingface.co and that will bring you to the, the first page of Hugging Face, which may look different to you because you you may not already have an account on Hugging Face. So if you do need an account or you need to sign in, there will be a little button over here that says sign up or log in. So you would follow that, create your account or log in, and then you will see something like this, at which point you go over to your profile, we you click new data set. We give our data set a name, I'm going to call it Langchain Docs. You can obviously call this whatever you want. Uh, you can set it to private if you want to keep this data set private. For me, also, I'm going to just leave it as public and you create your data set, right? So on here, this is like the, the page of your data set, like the home page of your data set. You go to files, you go to add file, upload files, okay? And then you just need to drag in the train.jsonl file to here. So for me, that is here, I'm just gonna go and drag that in. Okay, we go down, commit changes to main. Okay, so we have now uploaded that. We can go click on files here and we'll be able to see that we have the train.jsonl file in there. Now to actually use that in our code, we would need to pip install datasets. So this is a, like the library for hugging face datasets. And then we would write this. So we do from datasets import load data set and then our, our data would be load data set. Here we need the name of our data set. So let's go back to the, to the data set page. Okay, we can find that at the top here. So it's James Callum line chain docs. We can just copy it, add that into here. Our uh, split is the training split. So that's where the train.jsonl comes in and then we can view the data details there. Okay, and once that has loaded, we will be able to see, uh, we can just kind of extract things. So data zero, we can see that we have our text in there. So uh, it's super easy to work with. And that's kind of like why I recommend storing your data on hooking various data sets if you're wanting to share it. And even if you, you're wanting to do the private approach, you can you can do that as well. You just need, I think it's like an API key and that's pretty much it. So that's it for this video. I just wanted to cover some of the approaches that we take when we are considering how to chunk our text and actually process it for large language models and also see how we might store that data later on as well which you now both of these items, I think we kind of miss a lot in the typical videos we're really focusing on the large language model processing or the retrieval augmentation or, or whatever else, right? So this in reality is probably one of the most important parts of the entire process, but we miss it, miss it pretty often. Anyway, that's it for this video. So thank you very much for watching. I hope this has all been useful and interesting and I will see you again in the next one. Bye.